Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you'd get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Kate Campbell, welcome to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast. It is good to be back on this beautiful sunny day in Melbourne. Yes, it is indeed a very sunny day. Our regular listeners will know that this is a, a deep dive episode where we spend about 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes, we'll say, uh, providing an overview of an ETF or a share. Uh, keep in mind that if you do like these types of episodes, we know they've proven to be very popular from a listener perspective. Um, please write into us, tell us which company or ETF uh, you want us to cover. You can email us podcast at ras.com.au. But honestly, the best place to do it would probably be um, in the Facebook community or on Twitter or something like that, because we do run a poll. So um, if you're in the Facebook group, check out the, the poll for the March share idea. So this is where we put out a poll of, of a few different companies uh, that we might cover in the March deep dive episode, and you can vote on that. In today's episode, we're talking about Hack, which is trading on the ASX under the ticker symbol H-A-C-K. So if you ever see ASX, H-A-C-K, remember the ASX means it trades on the Australian Stock Exchange and the H-A-C-K or HACK is the ticker code that identifies. It's like the barcode for an investment. Um, HACK is a really popular ETF in Australia, as you're about to find out. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to talk about everything you need to know about it. Uh, just keep in mind that we're not recommending HACK. Uh, Kate and I, we're going to talk about it. We're not going to say that this is a recommendation. It's definitely not that. Uh, Kate does not own um, or have an investment in the Hack ETF and nor do I. And the date of this recording is uh, Wednesday, the 9th of Feb. So if any of the information is kind of a little bit uh, different to what you look up um, in Google or on the BetaShares website, just remember that we're recording it on this day. Um, and even on this day, the numbers can change. So um, yeah, Kate, we're going to talk about a really exciting ETF. So where do we start? Yeah. And Hack was actually chosen by our community. It was a very popular poll. There was a few mm. thematic invest ETFs involved. So uh, yeah, hopefully everyone enjoys this uh, quick little overview. And mm. yeah, I guess we just can jump into what is Hack, the BetaShares Global Cybersecurity ETF that is well and truly aptly named. Yes. So um, if you've ever thought the world is doomed because te technology is taking over, Maybe you're thinking, is China watching my Google search? Um, and then you've picked up your iPhone and you've put in one, two, three, four, five, six as your security code. And you think, mm, maybe that's not a good idea. Or have you ever asked yourself, it, Windows? Is Windows hack proof? Um, the chances are you're worried about the security of your technology. So you're thinking, okay, I use technology a lot. I'm every you know minute of every day, I have some interaction with technology. Um, how safe is my information? Um, you know, can I be sure that the personal thing that I'm communicating with is the personal thing that I thought I was communicating with? Um, basically, you're in this world of cybersecurity. So you want to know everything that you're doing online um, is secure and it's being, you know, the information is being transmitted as it should. And this is where we have cybersecurity companies. Um, my dad actually asked me the other day, he said, um, what type of antivirus software do you use? And I just looked at him like, what are you talking about? And then I remembered, it's been about five to 10 years that I've been using Apple devices and you don't need antivirus software necessarily on your Apple device um, where you do need it on your Windows or, or, or PC because um, it's a different architecture. And um, it's a little bit harder to crack an Apple device as it is a uh, another device. So basically, we're in this world where people are spending more and more on cybersecurity, uh, particularly businesses and enterprises, because we're doing more online. Um, there is a, a, a huge kind of thematic underneath this, which I know you'll get to in a second, Kate. But the Hack ETF, basically what it does is it bundles together global 
company. So it gets all of their shares and puts them into one ETF and you can buy that ETF on the ASX. So rather than going around and picking which individual cybersecurity company you think is, is a good company, you can buy the hack ETF uh, in your brokerage account and um, you get exposure to a bunch of different companies in this field. Um, and that's the basics of the hack ETF. Um, cybersecurity can be cut up a few different ways. So meaning that there are different types of cybersecurity. So there's, we're going to talk about some companies, but that's basically the bones of it. With hack, you get a basket of these cybersecurity companies that are playing on this thematic, which is more digitization, more internet um, equals more need for security online. And that's the hack ETF in a nutshell. Yeah, and the hack ETF might interest someone who really believes cybersecurity is an important theme for the next decade, wants to invest in that industry, but doesn't want to pick the one or two companies that they think are going to be the winners, and they want to diversify across a range of them. And most of these companies are based in the US, so you're not going to find them uh, through your, your Comsec or your Perler account. Uh, so you're going to have to actually, Perlo has US, so you might actually find them, but um, uh, you're going to have to, you can either buy those individual companies through a US brokerage account, or you can buy an ETF like Hack or something similar like that to give you that instant exposure. Um, and that's, it's what we call a thematic ETF. And we have done a whole episode diving into thematic ETFs and how they work, um, but it's just a really easy way to get access to a sector and so I know many of our listeners are always asking about different thematics and different themes that they're interested in. And so if you are interested in this area, I'd really recommend like diving into the, the holdings and looking into the area of cybersecurity, cybercrime, um, and learning more about this before just sort of diving straight into hack. Mm. Yeah, that's it. So we've just to, to clear up that idea of thematic, thematic in investing and in particular into ETFs, just um you can go back and listen to that episode or you can just listen to this definition. So when we talk about thematic, typically what we're saying is one theme. So one style of investing. So this, in this instance, we're talking about cybersecurity. Um, whereas when we talk about other types of ETFs, like index fund ETFs, typically what we mean is like an ETF that invests in basically everything. So it's not one theme, like it might have healthcare in there as well. It might have mm. mining companies. But when we talk about thematic ETFs, we're talking about a particular style um, of investing. So um, we'll get to what that means and how you position that in the portfolio in just a second. But Kate, maybe you can just run us through some of the facts um, about the Hack ETF as we know it today. Yeah, absolutely. So the Hack ETF has been around their inception date, just when the fund was launched really, has been around since August in 2016. So it does have quite a bit of a track record that we can look at. It's not a brand new fund that's like launched in 2020, 2021, mm -hmm. um, which is good because it means you can actually look at the performance chart and whether it's tracked the chosen index. For this particular ETF, they've chosen to use the NASDAQ Consumer Technology Association Cybersecurity Index. So beta shares then the aim of Hack is to track that index um, before fees and other expenses as well. So uh, you can actually look, um, Google that index and learn more about it, but um, it, it's very similar. It, like we'll replicate the holdings. Um, the management fees are 0.67% per year. So if you invested $10,000 in Hack today, over the next 12 months, they would take $67 worth of management fees out of the unit price. So they're not sending you a bill. It just magically gets taken out of the unit price when you're invested in it. So um, that makes it easier, but it also means you need to pay attention because that is maybe on the higher end for a management mm. fees for an ETF, but that is quite common for thematic ETFs because they are quite niche and they require a bit more work. Yeah, that's it. So 0.67% automatically taken out. Um, and yeah, it is a little bit higher than... Um, many others. I think the average for ETFs in Australia is now around 0.5%, pardon me. So this is 0.67, which is a little bit more than that. Typically you find, as you said, with the thematic ETFs, they are a little bit higher. Um, that does not necessarily, the more you pay, the more you get. It's just, um, that's not necessarily what it means. It's just that it, it does require more work because typically the the provider of the ETF, in this case, beta shares, has to pay more. Um, so uh, Kate, there are two things like do you get dividends slash distributions from this ETF um, and after I buy the hack ETF why am I getting this letter in the mail from someone called link market services what's that all about 
All right, so they do make semi-annual distributions. Occasionally it's an annual distribution, just looking at their recent table. So sometimes you'll get one a year, sometimes you'll get two a year. So it does pay to check that out. I mean, I'm probably not investing in cybersecurity for income in my bank account. I'm looking, I, if I was investing in cybersecurity, I'd be investing in this for growth. And I think that's similar with a lot of thematics. And so what will happen um, once you buy this ETF, you're going to get a letter telling you from Link Market Services saying, set up your account with us. And so once you set up your account, you'll actually be able to choose, do I want to reinvest that dividend? So instead of getting it paid out in cash to my bank account, whether that's $20 or $40 each year, I'm going to have that reinvested back through additional units into my holdings. So I can slowly grow my units so my holding in hack over time. Um, and so you have that choice and you can do that through Link Market Services, which is the ETF registry for hack. Yep, cool. So yeah, if you want to set up, uh, just to rehash that, if you want to set up like a dividend reinvestment plan, uh, go to Link Market Services for the hack ETF. In fact, I think all beta shares ETFs, if you're invested in a beta shares ETF, I think you can manage all of them through Link. I think Link does all of their share registry stuff. So go and check that out. Um, Kate, how much money is invested in the Hack ETF? So how much have all of the investors from all around Australia put in to the, the, the ETF and how much is inside it now? Yeah. So when I looked at this morning and BetaShares last updated this a couple of days ago on the 7th of February, 2022, they have around $723 million in the Hack ETF. So that's a big ETF. Yeah. So this for a thematic ETF, I was actually blown away by this because normally what happens at least because we're still so early in the ETF industry, um, what I typically see is that the like the vanilla kind of normal ETFs get more of the money and the thematic ETFs get less. Um, just because when you put them in a portfolio, uh, which we'll talk about in a bit, um, uh, an ETF like Hack, I would put that into kind of a smaller position in my portfolio, let's say it would be less than a, maybe say 5% because it the, what the ETF does is quite unique and you don't want a lot of your money in one of these really unique ETFs just in case you get the, that the uniqueness of that ETF ends up being the wrong call to make. And so um, typically what you find is that the thematic ETFs are a bit smaller than this. Um, the $723 million that Kate references, by the way, is not you know, it's not saying that this is a good ETF or that it's a really expensive ETF. What we're saying here is this is the amount of money that is invested in it currently. Mm -hmm. So this is the size of it. Some websites list this as market cap, um, but it's really that what we call funds under management, meaning that this is what is managed by the ETF. So, Kate, now that we've been through the nuts and bolts, did you want me to go through what the, uh, why the cybersecurity industry is popular? And then you can describe um, basically a bit more about like beta shares and all that. Yeah, absolutely. I know you've been quite interested in the cybersecurity industry over the last few years. And I think anyone that has investments, has bank accounts, has cryptocurrency should be interested in cybersecurity and how they can better protect themselves just from an individual perspective. But I know you want to talk about the, the wider perspective. Yeah, that's it. So um, I just got some numbers from Statista yesterday when I was looking at this and um, it's estimated that the market just for cybersecurity. So, you know, imagine when you pay for your antivirus or you get some sort of um, company that's paying for, you know, IT services to protect their, their servers and that sort of stuff. This market is estimated to hit $345 billion in annual like revenue for companies that operate in this industry by 2026. So this is a massive, massive market and it's growing fast. Some of the most important areas of this, um, I guess, industry are just standard IT services. So spending on people going out and doing things, uh, people managing you know, equipment and, and infrastructure. Um, the other thing is infrastructure protection. So this is like where you get, um, let's say you have cloud computing or you have um, on-premise um, servers and, and technology are getting protection for that. So it could be monitoring software. It could be really anything that comes around um, that kind of that space and how you need to protect that, that physical infrastructure. Um, and the, the other thing that is really interesting these days is identity protection and identity management. So this is something that I'll talk about in just a moment when we talk about one of the companies. But basically, oftentimes the weakest point in a technology system is the point where humans interact with it. So what I mean by that is when you put your password in, 
that's typically where most of the vulnerability is. It's not necessarily in the system itself. We can blame the system. We can blame it for being hacked or whatever. But typically, intruders get into a system by something silly that the human did, um, like having a weak password, for example. Um, there's a fantastic YouTube channel called um, Computer File. And um, one of the videos in there has many, many millions of views. And the uh, professor from the UK explains in very simple terms how he could basically crack all of the uh, crack is another word for hack, which is another word for break in. Basically, um, he could crack uh, passwords of basically everyone in the university that had a password of like say six characters or less in like milliseconds, um, just by running a very very simple algorithm. Um, and so the point is to use like numbers, letters, capitalized. You know, don't make them unique. But we all know that if we're logging into Google, we're logging into Apple, we're logging into um, Slack, Notion, whatever we use for work, Zoom, we don't want to have a different password for everything. So we end up using the same password or a very similar combination. And that makes it even easier again. So yeah, you know what terrifies me? Because Apple, um, in your passwords and security section, they now tell you how many yeah. times you've used that identical password on different sites on the web. And when you're seeing like, oh, you've used this password 52 times, you're like, oh, shit, that's not good. <laughs> And then you think about having to change all of that. That's just like a pain in the, yeah. So, yeah. Um, okay. So Kate, that's basically setting the scene. Cybersecurity is here. Um, we'll talk about some companies in just a minute. So Betas shares is the issuer of this ETF, right? So they, they manage it. Yeah. So many people in our community might be familiar with beta shares through A200, which is their ASX top 200 shares ETF that mm -hmm. um, many people use because it is quite low cost. But so beta shares is the overall umbrella manager. So they have over 50 different ETFs in Australia. They've just been going from strength to strength, really. They've been growing very rapidly. I feel like every second week I'm seeing a, a press release mm -hmm. in my inbox with a new ETF they've launched. Um, so they are growing quite rapidly. Uh, they do have a lot of ETFs. And so BetaShares sit there, they create all these products, they manage them day to day, they're helping create the units for you to buy and redeeming the units when you want to sell. And then they create all these different products and then you can go and buy one of these BetaShares ETFs like Hack through your Comsec, Perla, Stake account, whatever account you want, your brokerage account. Cool. And so what is Hack investing? Like this is a high level, what are they invested in? Yeah, so... One of the first things that if I'm interested in looking at investing in an ETF, I'm going to just Google the name, the code, and then ETF or ASX, and then the code, um, find their webpage on the ETF issuer, make sure you're on the right page because it will hopefully be the utmost up-to-date information. And so then I usually go and have a look at the sector allocation. So just looking at what different things this ETF is invested in. And so it has over half of the ETF is invested in companies that fall within the software definition. And then there's 14% um, falling in communications equipment. So you can have a look through and just get a general idea of those overall categories. And then you can go even a step further and they'll actually break down all the holdings. So uh, I think most people just look at the top 10. And so I'll just mention some names from the top 10 today, but you can look at all of them and just download a, a document that has all of them. And there might be over a hundred different companies, but some of them have a very small weighting. They might only weight be 1% of the ETF. And so you, if you invested hundred dollars in the ETF, only $1 of your money might be allocated to this small company, which is why we mm. usually look at the top 10 first, because in this case, nearly 7% of the ETF is allocated to a company called Cisco Systems. And so therefore, if you had $100 invested in this ETF, mm. around six or $7 would be in Cisco. Mm. And so like some other names that people would know here include Cisco, which obviously started as like a switching and network infrastructure company for those of you that know it, um, uh, Accenture, which does um, IT consultancy, uh, Palo Alto Networks, CrowdStrike, which I'll get to in just a minute, Cloudflare, which does um, kind of like edge computing and CDNs, uh, it's a bit geeky, um, but I love it, by the way, um, Checkpoint Software, VMware, uh, Juniper, uh, Tenable and Lidos. So these are the, the companies that round out the top 10. And it looks like just eyeballing it, we've got about 30 to 40% of the, the top, uh, the portfolio, the hack portfolio is invested in just these 10 companies. Um, there were about, I think there were, uh, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. I think there were about 65 holdings. The last time I checked, I'll just quickly get this up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah so there's, yeah, there's quite a few holdings. And so the smallest um, holding within the ETF 
uh, is a company by the name of Ribbon Communications. And just to put it in perspective, this has 0.1% of the portfolio invested in it. So this is where Kate was saying that it's best to look at the top 10 to see how much the top 10 make up and go from there. Yeah. So Kate- and when I'm, oh, sorry. I was just saying when I'm looking at a thematic ETF, I will usually do a bit of research on the top 10 holdings, the overall thematic, but I won't go through all 65. I'll have a glance through, but I'm not going to be uh, researching in much detail the 0.1% allocation holdings at the very bottom of that list. Because some of the ETFs have can have hundreds or thousands of um, holdings within. And so you have to use your time wisely. You only have so many hours in the day. So you have to pick what is going to be the highest return of my time. I'm going to actually spend some time looking at the top 10 and the overall thematic. But I mean, everyone has their own process looking at thematic ETFs. They do. Um, I might share now, Kate, in the interest of getting this down to 20 minutes, yes. we, um, I might just quickly run through two of the companies that I know from this list and um, just explain what they do, because that will help people put it uh, to put it in perspective for people. Is that okay? Yeah, that'd be awesome. Cool. So the first company is a company called Okta, uh, O-K-T-A uh, is the name. And Okta uh, is run by a guy named Todd uh, out of the US. And what Okta does is basically... It's created probably what is the world's most advanced SSO, and that means single sign-on. So if you've ever gone to a website and you've seen something now that says single sign-on, um, so you could say put in your password and your username, or you could do single sign-on. Um, what this basically means is that you only have to put in your password once and it automatically logs you into a bunch of different stuff. So what I mean by this is the best example of SSO or single sign-on technology is Google. Um, When you go to Gmail and you log into your Gmail and then you go across to YouTube, you will notice that if you're in the same web browser, you're already logged into YouTube if you've logged into Google on the previous page. And the reason is that they use the same kind of login infrastructure so you log in from at gmail which is a google product and then you visit youtube also a google product or google maps also a google product you're automatically logged in okta does the same thing with a single sign-on technology but it does it for workplaces and enterprises and it makes money by charging a subscription to companies to use that software and so it's broken down into two parts of their business there's got identity management which is verifying people when they log in and they've got workforce management. And the future of Okta is um, a really exciting one. I own shares in Okta. Um, The future of Okta is basically you sign on once and it logs you into every single app you ever need for your business. Um, The average enterprise in America has a hundred different software applications that they use uh, for their day to day. So the second company that I wanna talk to is a company called CrowdStrike, Kate. I believe this is a company you own shares in. I do not own shares in. Yes. So CrowdStrike uh, trades under the ticker symbol CRWD. CrowdStrike takes the idea of what's good for you is good for me. Um, And basically what it does is it's created this this network called Falcon Fusion. Sounds like a cool name. Um, And basically it's called (laughs) Unified Extensible Saw Framework. Um, And that's a fancy way of saying that what CrowdStrike does is it creates a network of linked computers like my computer right now and your computer at home And what it does is it says, if Owen has been hacked or looks like he's being hacked, we'll defend Owen's computer. But then what we'll do is we'll take that information that we realized that that helped us realize that Owen's being hacked and we'll apply that to Kate's computer right now. So both of them are protected. And so it uses this kind of identify and defend um, idea against Um, I think it's trillions of different signals that it takes in every single day from across its network. And it helps companies and um, individual individuals who are using their computers to be defended against. So the the fantastic thing about this, this CrowdStrike business and the Falcon Fusion technology is that companies typically start with like one module of Falcon, and then they have 21 different modules that each company can then pay for as a subscription. So in the third quarter of 2021, I believe it was, CrowdStrike had had, uh, 14,687 paying customers, but it added 1,600 new customers in one quarter. So over 10% of an increase in customers in just one three-month period. Um, But what was really interesting for me, and these are two geeky numbers I'm going to throw at you real quick, is um, the number of customers that have more than four modules of Falcon grew by 68%. So 
So what that means is customers are taking up more than just the basic level of protection through CrowdStrike. And that means they make more money. Um, and so there's this metric that we follow in investing as analysts, we call it a DBNR or dollar-based net retention. And what this does is just to break it down in super simple terms, what are the customers from last year spending this year? Um, and what we can see is that around um, the customers from last year spend 25% more this year. So what that tells you is even if CrowdStrike doesn't get new customers, it's still going to grow its revenue because the customers from last year are still going, oh gosh, CrowdStrike actually does this other thing. I'll get that as well for us. Or oh, CrowdStrike does this for us. And this is like basically free money because CrowdStrike has already created this amazing software and customers can take it up. So those are the two companies I've, I've pulled out. Um, we've got Okta, which does single sign-on technology and CrowdStrike, which does this artificial intelligence network to defend against uh, intrusion. So fantastic companies. Um, I own shares in Okta, you own shares of CrowdStrike, um, both included in the hack ETF at the time of recording. So Kate, as we come to the end of this, um, how could hack be used in a portfolio? Yeah, so we've mentioned before about the core and satellite portfolio where 80% of your portfolio might be made of staple ETFs like an ASX 200 ETF, a US top 500 shares ETF, maybe some bonds, maybe some emerging markets, maybe some real estate investment trusts, whatever you want in your core portfolio. And then you can be a little bit more, I don't know, risk takerish ish That is yeah, not yeah. a word, but you can take a few more risks to <laughs> have a bit more fun. Um, I mean, I... Sometimes they say investing shouldn't be fun, but I mean, I enjoy looking at different themes and different companies. And so that could form the other 20% of your portfolio. So you've got the core in the middle that is going to uh, help you build wealth over the next 40 years. And then you've got some other interesting things, maybe some individual stock positions. Maybe that's where you want to have your cryptocurrencies. Maybe that's where you want to have a thematic ETF like hack or something in a different theme around the outside. And so you might only allocate 2% of your overall portfolio to hack. If you are thinking that cybersecurity is a theme I've learned a lot about, I'm really interested in, and I think over the next five or 10 years, it's going to grow substantially. Mm -hmm. I think that's the that's the way I'd use this ETF too. I'd have it as a small position in a, a diversified portfolio. We, we do not, we have, we have not recommended this company at RASC. Um, we, in our ETF, portfolios uh, many of our listeners are members of our subscription and our membership service where we kind of outline four portfolios for people to follow um we'd like i think of them as like recipes that people can follow um and then they can you know put them together themselves um in that in those portfolios we haven't recommended hack yet we might in the future and if we do it would probably be in our thematic portfolio or even if it's in our flexi portfolio it might be a saying are saying you could you could build your portfolio as a core over here using these solid ETFs, but then you might add hack for the next three to five years for growth mm. or something like that. And that's not to say that it's not, I don't think it's a good ETF. I think it's a good ETF. It's just we haven't we chose to get um, our thematic exposure somewhere else. Yeah. And I would say that it's a good ETF. Um, just be aware that it's probably going to have more ups and downs. The way the actual ETF is constructed, I won't go into detail right now, but the way the ETF is constructed and then rebalanced inside itself can result in the ETF being a bit more volatile, having a few more ups and downs. Uh, that's okay because we're investing for five, 10 years, but just be aware that it's not going to be like the A200, which is a bit more stable and pays a dividend. Uh, this one might be a bit more, bit more wild. So Kate, yeah. one, one final question, which I'll ask you is like, people have got to the end of this, this hack thing sounds pretty interesting. How do I actually go and buy and invest in this ETF if I want to? Yeah. So if you want to buy units of hack, you're going to need a brokerage account. And I'm going to link our two-part choosing a broker series in the podcast show notes. But just to get you started, it's that middleman that's going to help facilitate those transactions. So you never have to find yourself a buyer or a seller. That all happens magically over the internet. And some examples that are quite popular with our community, not recommendations, includes Comsec, Stake, Perla, Self-Wealth, and Sharesies. And they all have different rules and different ways to get started and different initial purchase size. Sometimes you can start with $5. Sometimes you need $500. But I would recommend checking out our Broker Basics series to get started. And also joining our Facebook community because there's often posts of people saying, hey, I'm interested in this kind of thing. What broker 
uh, would be helpful for me there. So just go and search, join the group, search broker, and you'll find lots of different resources there. Yeah, for sure. We've got those podcasts and we've got the um, the Facebook community. Fantastic. Uh, I will give one shout out for if you do, if you're thinking, okay, um, Owen doesn't recommend this ETF to his members and to the members of, of RASC, what else is recommended? Um, you can join the, the RASC ETF service, which is where you'll find those portfolios and see what we've put together. Um, it's $49 if you use the coupon code AFP. There's a link in your podcast player now if you want to sign up. Um, it's $49 and that gives you lifetime access to these model portfolios that we've designed and we continue to monitor. Um, so please go ahead and do that. Jump into the jump into your podcast player, click that link. The coupon code is AFP uh, and it gets you about 50% off. So Kate, wonderful discussion about Hack. I know this will be a popular episode because it's a really interesting ETF. It's really topical right now. Um, so I think if you want to vote on next month's uh, share or ETF, jump into the Facebook group, let us know uh, and get in touch with us at podcast at rash.com.au. Kate, as always, thanks for joining me on this episode. Thanks for listening, everyone.